Hi everybody and welcome to Mom Your Own Way. I'm Lily Coco and today's my guest is Nicole Rowan and she is a mom. She is a pastor from Orange County and she currently has her own woman conference. Um, so I'm so excited to talk to her. I'm so excited to get to know her. So let's just dive right in. Oh, it's supposed to be a song. Hold on. Let's dive right in. Check it. Hi, Nicole. Hi. Welcome, welcome. I had already messed up the beginning with my song, so hopefully the rest of this goes a little bit smoother. <laughs> but it's so nice to meet you. I'm obsessed with your wall. I think it's beautiful. Are you doing it yourself or are you guys oh, thank hiring? Thank you. No, my husband did it all. Yeah, we're in the final stages. Amazing. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I'm so excited to get to know you. I did a little scooping just like through Instagram and seeing what you're all about, but Tell me about yourself and how you got here today and all the things that you've done. I mean, being a pastor, you mentioned for 15 years, is a, that's a big chunk of your life. It's a big part of who you are, but I'd love to get started wherever you want to start your story of how, how you got here and then jump into motherhood as well. Yeah. Okay. So the short version is um, I my husband and I lived in California for 15 years. He's from there. I had moved there from Kentucky. Um, to go to Bible college, we were church planters and pastors for 15 years. The Lord asked us to get an RV and do itinerant ministry for a year. So we did that in 2020. Wow. We moved all of our four children under the age of five at that time in our RV, including a newborn who was two months old, um, and traveled and actually did more traveling and ministry in 2020 when everything was shut down than ever before. Mm. Um, and then we moved to Nashville. God moved us to Nashville. Had never really been to where we are or uh, saw the house before we bought the house. Oh. So <laughs> God just plopped it in our hearts. And so that's where we are now. We have a, a, a house church on Thursday nights and I still run a podcast and a couple of ministries outside of here, but that's the, that's the quickest version of kind of who I am and what we do. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot to move with kids. Yeah. Yeah. You said four, right? Yes. Man, you're brave. I love how much like faith and, and you have and confidence into where God's leading you and where you feel that you should be. And I think sometimes, especially with kids, it's kind of hard to know if you're making the right decision. Yeah. And then when it involves your entire family, that takes courage because you know it's the right thing to do. But yeah. it, it could be hard. Was it hard, difficult with them? Yeah. You know, I mean, living in an RV was something we had never done before. I wasn't like an avid camper. You know, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I love camping. I'm like, I never went camping. I don't even know that life. But we really just have a value in our family to hear the voice of God and just to be obedient and yielded to what he asked us to do. And so, because that's a big value, we just kind of flow with the Holy Spirit in that way. But was it hard? Yes, it definitely had its hard moments. Um, but anytime there's purpose behind the pain, it gives you a reason to propel forward, you know? So we always that. had the purpose in our hearts of, um, sharing the gospel in a time that, um, churches were shut down and people weren't hearing the word of God. And so the pain, you know, sometimes outweighed the, what we thought our purpose was, but m mostly the purpose outweighed the pain. So it had its, it had its hard moments, yeah. but my kids have fond memories. Um, we homeschooled on the road and it was a wild time, but I'm super grateful for that opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely get close with somebody in sm such small quarters and then constantly moving. Um, yes. <laughs> and just not, not having space can get yeah. on anyone's ner nerves, and that's just with one person. But when you have a whole family with different characters, different personalities, it can get yeah. heavy. Yeah. But good job for you doing that. I, I'm really impressed because, like you said, in the pandemic, everyone was just struggling so much, and everyone was kind of – everyone needed some sort of escape and an outlet for – just personal things for spiritual things and nobody could go anywhere and so it was just this rough place for people I felt so bad I felt really bad for kids yeah uh, just because I have higher expectations of adults to kind of understand it and be able to like process it better but for yeah. kids to be able not to go see their friends things are locked up they can't go to their favorite place they can't get their you know like and they have so much energy to burn and so I was sad that like everything had to be closed and schools and churches. And I mean, they did everything. Yeah. 
But I love that you took it into your own hands and you guys decided. How did you decide? How did you? Yeah, we, so we were in, um, in Orange County in what we felt like was a transition. We had transitioned off of our church leadership team and I was pregnant. Mm. And so we knew that there would be a change coming with the pregnancy, but, um, this is kind of a funny story. So my husband comes to me one day and he says, I feel like the Lord says to get an RV and travel to which I said in my very pregnant state, tired and fat, you know, I was like, listen, I thought that I married a man who heard from the Lord and clearly I didn't because that cannot be the Lord, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And he was like, Hey, just sit on it. Just think about it. I'm like, I don't need to think about it. I don't need to pray about it. It's for sure. a No. And then sure enough, um, over the next, you know, maybe two or three weeks, the Lord began to speak to me about it. And I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? Like postpartum newborn, like how, is that even possible? Is this even responsible? You know? And he just began to soften my heart towards it. So sure enough, we buy an RV. That was like a whole other anointed story, but by this RV, we renovated it in three weeks and then we hit the road and God gave grace for it. Did you renovate while pregnant? No, I was like a couple weeks postpartum. Oh, I don't know if that's better or worse. <laughs> yeah, I think it would have been better had I been pregnant because, you know, painting cabinets in between the baby's nap or a feeding or, you know how it is, like right after birth. So that part I probably wouldn't suggest, but um, God gives grace. He gave a lot of grace. Um, I'm glad that that part is over. I don't know that I will ever renovate an RV again, but I'm glad to have that in my memory. <laughs> yeah. And so you guys just traveled for that year and then ended up in Nashville? Yeah, we traveled for the year. We went to every state except for North Dakota, and we got to minister. It was really beautiful. Um, and as we were praying, there were a few states on our hearts, and I had had some vivid dreams about where not to move to. Mm -hmm. which I was really sad by because there was a couple states where I was like, I really want to go there. I love this place. But God said no. And then there was a door open in Nashville and it was just not on our radar. I mean, at all. Mm -hmm. And we just followed through the doors that we felt like was promptings from the Lord. And then we got here and we often say, can you believe that we are in Tennessee? It is so weird, <laughs> but we're thankful and we're excited to see what God does. Um, we're on the journey, you know, like life with the Lord as a disciple is, is a laid down life. It's a journey with him. So we're honored to be a part of that in whatever way he'll use us. I love how much openness you have towards it. It shows like this easy, I'm sure things are not easy, but like in easiness with an acceptance when it comes to certain situations or things, or, um, I've recently just been thinking about like either past stress or pressure we put onto ourselves or anything in the future where we have anxiety worrying about things. And that's what honestly occupies so much of our brain span is just, oh, why did I say this? Why did I do this? Or what if this happens? What if this happens? And yeah. to be able to accept things, you know, through God's grace saying whatever happened, happened because it needed to be for this bigger plan. And whatever will happen is out of my control. To completely let that go and just be saying, here I am. Like that's so much openness and be able to do it with a family. I really applaud you. Yeah. That, I don't know how you do. I, I, I am working on it right now where I try not to be stubborn against change where something changes. It's not up to my expectations. I of course want to run the other way. I want to be like, that's not what I had in mind. That's not yeah. how I pictured it. And of course God has a bigger picture where we, you know, I haven't think about this in, in kids where, when you're trying to change a kid's diaper, they're uh, wiggling out because they're trying to help, but yes. they're actually getting in the way. And so yes. I often think of it as me, when I'm trying to wiggle and help, I'm actually hindering. What I need to do is just sit still yeah. so then God can do the work he needs to do. Um, it's just silly how it works. But I am i don't know how you did it, to how, how you have such a good positive attitude about here I am. Like there, It seems so effortless mm -hmm. for you. Mm. No, de definitely don't give me that much credit. It's, it's, you know, it's a journey. And especially as moms, like we, our kids teach us so much, like your diaper example is so accurate to life as an adult, right. And as a follower of Jesus. And so our kids are able to teach us the flexibility and the freedom and 
to be childlike, to be fun, to not be so, I, I typically am like a very planned, structured person. That is my mm-hmm. personality. I really love that. Um, but my kids have taught me to just have fun in the moment, to be free in the moment and to give up some of those expectations of what I thought things were going to look like or be like, or, you know, you know, plan out. And, um, I, I'm just, I'm constantly learning from, you know, a six-year-old and a five-year-old and a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I'm like, oh my gosh, they are like discipling me in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but the flexibility piece, I think is just key for life. It's just the disciples had to be flexible in a lot of ways. So just, it's a learning, yeah. it's a learning curve. It's funny. I, I'm also very like type A where I like to have things planned out. And if I could highlight everything I've done, so I have it in a row, I would. And something I started doing yesterday, but to remind myself that some things don't have to be as I had planned them is because I always match my socks out of laundry and in laundry, like my socks are matched. And so I decided that now I'm going to wear not matching socks because that's one of the things that doesn't matter. And so when I look down at my feet, I'm like, it's okay when some things are out of control because yeah. it's, it's <laughs> not actually important. Like what colored socks and my socks aren't matching is totally okay. Yes. And so it's my little way of like, okay, like a little reminder. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. I wish I had time to think about my socks matching. I, I think I'm beyond that of, I don't even have the luxury of thinking about things matching. I mean, if I get to brush my hair, I feel like it's a win for the day. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I, uh, especially with a big family, I currently struggle sometimes giving myself time to like brush my hair. Sometimes I'll go like four days and I'm like, okay, I really haven't showered. I really haven't brushed my hair because I put my child's needs before mine. Uh, and I think we kind of get stuck in it, but I, I admire moms cause I'm only doing this with one baby. You've got four, like your time really is stretched. And then on top of that, you're doing the conference and the house church. You're doing so much. I'm so proud of you. That takes a lot of work. You really don't have a lot of time, huh? Yeah, everything is pretty scheduled or just fly off the seat of your pants, you know? What's your normal day like? What's your normal like day routine for you guys? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm homeschooling my kiddos. Um, well, and my my youngest is just kind of along for the ride. But we try to hit the gym every morning um, so that my kids get their in, their morning. I feel like these kids wake up with so much energy. I'm like, how can I yeah. get that? Yeah. Did I have that as a kid? Like, where do I find that? Can we bottle that up and like yeah. have it in an energy drink? Like, what in the world am I getting? There's up, old? just like up. I think it's getting old because now I'm like, Cause I'll be in a bad mood. I'm like, why am I in a bad mood? It's like, oh, they're just excited. I'm just not as excited as my daughter. Like if I just get yes. up and I'm excited, I'm so there, but I'm just like, no, I need 17 cups of coffee and a slow toast in my bed while I lounge I in slippers. Uh, like I think it's just getting old though, <laughs> which I don't yeah, want to admit, I but know, I know I literally thought, <gasps> I thought, wow, I think I'm old because you guys have so much energy and it was like 7 a.m. and they had it for a straight hour and I'm like, okay, but yeah, the routine piece to answer your question. So we we try to do something active in the morning, whether it's like go on a hike, go on a walk, get outside, go to the gym. And then I tried to to do some one-on-one time with my kids and that's really hard. I don't always succeed at that but I I do attempt to do we'll put the baby down for a nap and so then I can have the older kids and we'll do a like my daughter loves crafts so we'll do a craft with her and and I'm talking like it's minimal you know it's like 10 12 minutes and then I spend time with my son and we'll like build something together and then I spend time with my older son and we'll normally it's something active like jump on the trampoline or whatever but I I try to give them that individual time Mm -hmm. where for me it feels like a lot but you know it's really like maybe 10 to 12 minutes but to them it feels like their whole day so they're super stoked to be able to have one-on-one time with me and then with my husband um so our routine does look different daily but I do try to do those two things we we always try to do something active we I always try to do something um one-on-one with them I love that so much. When I talk to moms who have multiple kids, something they often mention is 
that I think we need to be reminded about daily, but how every baby is different. And then you get matching, not matching, but different personalities in one home. And then how you parented one child, usually first one, then your second one's going to be different because they'll have different needs or how they learn is going to be different. The amount of attention they're going to need, their like love language is going to be different. And so having to like format a relationship with each child yeah and and changing it did you do you have really different pregnancies i wanted to ask because you have so many you know i um we adopted our oldest and so i've had three pregnancies um the first two came early and then the last one came really late so that was kind of a shocker but all in all i would say that they were similar but i I agree with what you've learned from parents with multiple kids each kid is different and i would even go as far to say that you know boys versus girls it's a very different style of parenting and Mm. of time spent with one another there's absolutely a distinct difference between male children and female children um and it's important to understand what that looks like like my daughter wants um like crafts and like she calls it girl time she wants girl time and my sons they want us to like go on a bike ride or jump on the trampoline like they want something active and like they want to wrestle. <laughs> they want to. I need it's to adrenaline. Some coffee. Yeah, <laughs> some coffee for them. Um, but it's it's different. My daughter doesn't respond the same way as my boys do, and so I, I mean, I'm, I've only been a parent for seven years, so I'm still learning. Like, what does this look like, and how do we do this without making our kids have to go to copious amounts of therapy as they're older? You know. Um, but I, 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 I honestly think the the spending time and the recognizing emotions and feelings and validating those things, I think those, if we as parents can grab a hold of those things, I think that makes all the difference. Such a big fan of that. I'm such a big fan of that. I'm finding more and more like through my own like healing journey of how much of things that happened in my childhood had affected me and then more conversations I have with mostly other moms you know, we kind of work through like the trauma and how do we help our kids? Because I think it's one of the best things we could do for our kids is if we raise them with all of these validations and feeling that they are enough, they are important and they matter. Yeah. As you grow up, I feel like I had wasted maybe 12 years f- trying to fill a void, trying to get an acceptance, trying to get, um, you know, some sort of emotional hole filled because there are certain things that have traumatized me and not to lately am I just uncovering the layer saying, oh my gosh, I was only doing this for this. I was only doing this for this. I wasn't really truly being myself. I wasn't following my calling or what's inside my heart. I was, you know, whether it be trying to get the likes, trying to get somebody to like you, somebody, just trying instead yeah. of actually being. And it, that's just such a waste of time because it's all just finding these different masks you wear instead of finding out who you truly are, who you're going to look at in the mirror. Yeah. And I want to support my daughter where she's not wasting any time she has confidence in herself or she's not going to waver with some silly comment that isn't going to take it to her heart because she's going to know within herself this is what i'm about yeah it's sad how how many people are so so broken we spend so much time then trying to heal those wounds without the proper knowledge because yeah. a lot of times it takes the acceptance to know that, hey, actually something is wrong with me. Like I, for me, I didn't know for a long time that something was. I had put it in such a, like in the backpack of my mind that it like, it almost wasn't real. And then later, once you accept it, you start working on it. But I know for a fact, there's still so many people who aren't even aware that something may have happened to them if they were mistreated or with an older uh, generation of parenting, they used to do things a lot more harsh and that could be physical trauma or emotional trauma. I mean, there's so much baggage that gets added onto our kids. Yeah. And then they try to unravel it. It's like we just wrap them up in this yarn ball and say, good luck unraveling that till you find who you are. And we're just, that's what needs to prepare our kids. I think I'm a big fan of homeschooling because I think that's a yeah. parent's job to instill those values in them and say, here are the things that I can teach you so no one's putting stickers on you with weird beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, someone said this quote when we were, my husband and I were early married. They said, you know, when you get married, you realize how selfish you are. And when you have children, you realize how angry you are. And Mm. I remember at the time I didn't understand that because I was, I think this was like in our premarital or something, but I was like, that's such a weird thing. Why would you be angry? Like when you have children, that doesn't make any sense. And then I had kids 
And I started to see a lot of what you're talking about, you know, the trauma starts to come up, the triggering starts to happen of, you know, how we were treated as kids or how we were brought up or how um, we had expectations around childhood and parenting and, you know, all of that. And so I, I tell people now, I'm like, listen, you can't avoid trauma. You can't avoid situations happening in your life. There is death and mourning and situations and things that are painful. But the one thing that you can do is keep an open line of communication for your kids with transparency and vulnerability. And that's the best anyone can do because there might be yeah. someone listening and they go, I'm ill equipped to prepare my kids for, you know, dealing with trauma. Well, you don't need to be a trauma counselor. You just need to be a listener. You just need to be a communicator to be able to start to walk them through these processes and figure out, you know, why did that hurt your feelings or validating emotions? You know, wow, I can tell something I say in my household a lot is, wow, I can tell you're really upset. <laughs> you know, in my <laughs> head, I'm thinking, you don't need to be upset. This is so silly. Yeah. But for them, it's a big deal. So they drop their popsicle. It falls out of the, you know, the container. I'm like, whatever. But to them, it's a big deal. So, you know, I, wow, I can see you're really upset. That's a big bummer and validating those things so that it doesn't become a root of an issue for the future in adulthood or in their parenthood, but yeah. also having the grace to understand like us parents, we are not going to get it all right. It's actually not our job to parent them in all the right ways. It's the Lord's job. And so if we can point them to Christ, if we can point them to the one who actually can save their souls and we can just become line of communication and the person they can be vulnerable and transparent with, then that changes the game. I mean, that's at least yeah. what I've, what I've experienced thus far, having had situations like you mentioned with my childhood and learning emotional healing and even spiritual intelligence and EQ and all that. And, trying to figure out how do we do this well for our kids and for the next generation. Yeah. Something I talked to, um, some something that stuck with me that when I talked to somebody was, we were talking about raising kids and we were talking about how often it's, you know, let's say you were raised this one way. If you want to do it differently, you're just going to do the opposite mm -hmm. of how they raised you, but almost in a way of how you wish you were raised. Yeah. And something to remember is as much as we want to do that, the best we can actually do is raise the child how they need to be raised. So we have to understand the things that happened, decide which ones were bad and good, and then without inflicting our own anxiety, pain, trauma on them because we're trying to protect them from it, help them grow into who they are supposed to be not for them to grow up to be mini me's or mini yeah. dads or mini whatever yes they'll have certain traits certain characteristics that are going to match the mom and dad but they are their own individual person their relationship with god, god is going to be their own individual relationship and so instead of having to parent them how we weren't or how we were it's identifying both and then figuring out how how do I help this one specific kid? Because each kid, again, is going to be different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's smart because we do want to, you know, flip the, go to one end and make that really loud and bold. And it's going to be the complete opposite. But in reality, like when we say things like, we're never going to be like my mom was to me, or I'm never going to be like that to my kids, we're actually inviting that spirit in a way, yeah. you know, it kind of sounds like weird language, but I guess to put it in a different terms, like we're inviting that, um, like tone, like tone and expectation, even by saying we're not going to be like them yeah. it's still on the forefront of our mind. And so if we can switch that language to, man, I want my kids to feel loved and known and accepted and at home yeah. and focus on those versus the things we're not going to do. I think that that's better. Yeah. Yeah. There's something that you mentioned, the tone, because if you're doing something in like vengeance, because it almost like, well, I'm going to parent them better or, you know, in this other way. But if you're doing it out of vengeance almost where it's like, yeah. and this is something I read when you said it, I was like, oh, I, I have a little bit of that in me where I'm like, oh, because this happened, it happened to me this way. I want to change it. And I don't want to think that way. I don't want it to come from a vengeful place because I want to I want it to come from a place of love. I think yeah. all the decisions should come from a place of love. Um, but that's the learning and unlearning we have to do to figure out 
where is it actually coming from? Is my reaction, my attitude, my response, is this coming from because I was hurt and I recognize it now I'm triggered? Or is this come, become, coming because I want to change the way it happened to me? Or is this yeah. the appropriate response for me with this child in this situation? Yeah, that's good. Ugh, but it's hard. I mean, things are just moving so fast. I also recently learned that like within the brain development, we tend to only remember 20% of what happened the day before. And that's why it's often almost flows like we're living in the same day. And it feels like the day only repeats because we forget 80%. And so we're almost kind of living in the yesterday. Oh, wow. And so sometimes if you have like certain thoughts and you have like certain revelations, you're like, oh, I really get it. And then the next day you might just forget about it because that might be the part of the day that you forgot. And that's why I think like praying, journaling is so important because you like concrete it again, you know, you kind of really put it in there. Um, But I was thinking about that and how it's hard to like, the information that we learn is constant. So things are going so fast, yet our learning is a little bit slowed down. And so when you want to... Um, I haven't had an, like m- me losing my temper on my kids or on my child or anything, but I can see how other parents have had because things are just moving so fast and we're so used to reacting instead of yeah. responding quite yet because we haven't done the work to look within and say, oh, well, I'm not actually angry at you. I'm angry from within because I'm remembering this experience that happened to me. And the resentment comes through because almost even if... If you if the situation is happening to the other person is better than what happened to you because you're like well that's not what happened to me and there's that whole mm. comparison it's weird yeah. yeah and you know I think it's important to remember especially like people that are listening with one or two kids you know when you get to the three four five range and even with two I mean that yeah it's not just like big families but the things that our kids trigger in us are normally things that we haven't dealt with you know so. Mm. Instead of thinking like, well, my kid's manipulative and they're just out to ruin my day. (laughs) Yeah. You can feel that way sometimes. Yeah. But if you take a step back and you go, wait a second, they're four. They're not trying to ruin your day. You didn't, they didn't know that you had plans to clean your toilets today. And then they woke up early from their nap. Like they're not manipulative. They're actually desiring more time with you or desiring that connection. But if we can take a step back and go, wait a second, where have I felt manipulation? Mm. Where have I felt something was stolen from me? Time was taken from me. If we can start to examine our own hearts and our own histories, we will parent better. I mean, it's worked for me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm such a better parent when I'm able to go, this child's not trying to take my time. They're not trying to manipulate. They're not trying to, you know, do me wrong. They just want connection. Yeah. Then I can see, I can have a different perspective for parenting in those cases. Yeah. That's something that helps me when, you know, I can feel her kind of bottling up. Things are about to kind of explode. And I'm like, she's not doing it on purpose or things that annoy me. I'm like, she's not doing, that's not on purpose. And it, I'm yeah. trying to focus on taking fault out of the way. Cause sometimes I, it's so easy to put a fault or a blame on something, but like our yeah. kids are never, I mean, they could be at fault if they like drop something or whatever, but they didn't do it with a bad intent. If they drop yes. something or they, you know, if it's a baby, they keep dropping stuff. They're not doing it to piss you off. They like the right. motion. They're just right. playing with it. Or if they spill or if they're late, like you said, they don't know our schedule. They don't know that like traffic starts at six or the stores close at 10 or that your boss sucks and you have to get to work faster. Like they don't necessarily have that grasp. And so when they take time or they do things on their own, Yes. They're not doing it to mess with you. They're not doing it to mess you up. But if you've been That's into right. like a bad relationship or your sibling would always make you late for a reason or whatever, you're actually connecting this new relationship to this other one that actually hurt you and Yeah. No, that's right. And we and we constantly have to evaluate why we are having those emotions and things come up. We have to evaluate what it is inside of us that's causing those things to happen. Otherwise, we just go, we're a bad parent. We can't do this or we're being triggered and we don't know why. Let me show you my little guy. Say hi. Aww. Hi, Bubba. Hi, he has some. Oh, you got you got something? Okay. Cool toy. Mm. I love this age. This is two years old. I love uh. it. I love it. <laughs> what was the hardest age? Was it different for each one? 
Oh, good question. Um, I don't have like a specific hard age. I just, I feel like with each age comes a different challenge. Like with each, you know, they're two, they can hard, they're, they're just walking or, you know, they've been walking less than a year and they, um, they can't really talk that well, you know? So you're like, Oh, it's so sweet. And then I have like a five-year-old who has learned the word stupid and boy, she knows that that's a no, no in our house. And so she gets mad and she says that word. And I'm like, Oh, you were so cute when you were two, <laughs> but then, you know, she's super helpful and she's a lot of fun and we have girl dates and we can go have a salad together. And that's something I can't do with my two-year-old. So I think with every age it's, it's different. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't have a favorite age, although that is a question that I ask. <laughs> of parents, I'm like, okay, prepare me for what's like the worst age, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, they always say like terrible twos, but it. I think probably the what I think is that the difficulty changes. You know, at the beginning, it's more like emotional or like physical being needed so much, or making sure you help them walking, or if they're falling, it's more physical attention and help versus when they're older, then it's more emotional help. They're going through the oh. breakups. They're dealing with the best friends. So-and-so said this, yes. and, you know, they have crushes, and you're like, I don't even know when my daughter comes to me and ta- talks tells me about a crush. Oh, right. I have I, a friend, and she's like, my son's going on a date, and I'm like, am I old enough to have friends whose sons are going on dates? Like, is that man. real? Is that happening? Yeah, so I... I'm That's always happening. learning and I always tell young parents, like, find the parents that are right. doing well, it and uh, you can learn from and like you can grow, grow with and be mentored by because we don't have all the answers, you know? And we it changes all the time. It changes all the time. I um, was giving this example of, you know, we should be easy with our kids and toddlers because they're constantly like bloated. They're trying new foods. They have a teeth toothache. They're kind of walking, so they're sore. Um, there's all of this yeah. stuff, and somebody had commented like, "Oh, well, the doctors have proved that babies don't feel soreness." And I thought, "Yeah, okay, but the doctors also said that babies, when they're born, don't feel any pain. It would perform open surgery on yeah. babies, and then that changed." So like. I, I just can't comprehend how babies don't feel soreness. I think it heals really fast because they're just, but like they're still a human body and the muscles are at work and that's what they're doing when they're crawling and walking and all the activities. But yeah. it's something to say that like things are constantly changing. So even if we had, which we currently do right now, is this opportunity to get information from anywhere in the world, online and different yes. apps and books, right. we still have to... Um, I just, because now it's too much information. Yeah, and there's so much out there. You'll have to forgive me. I'm going to take you on my drive to go pick up my kids because I just realized my daughter has dance, and I forgot. So Perfect. forgive me. <laughs> no, you know what we're going to do is make sure that you're being safe so we can do our closing as you start your driving. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what I would say to that is there is a lot of information we have to be very prayerful about where we're getting information, but we also have to recognize God's given us grace to be our kids' parents, right? So no one else is to be your daughter's parent besides you, besides who God has anointed, either be birth parent, adoptive parent. God's given you that grace. And so we have an intuition that is connected to the heavens, if you will. I, I'm, a, I'm a Jesus follower, firm Christian so th- this is the language that I use, but if we can recognize that we actually have the grace to parent, then we won't be overwhelmed or overcome by, do I feed my child this food or that food, take them to this doctor, that doctor, this school, that school. And we just start to go, God, what, what are you asking me to do as Rosella's mom, you know, as Rorick's mom, what is my responsibility and assignment in this? Then it frees us up. Yeah. Because good grief, when I first became a parent, I'm like, I don't even think I can keep up with all the things. And, and then people feel like they get, you know, really overwhelmed and they have shame and blame and they're carrying like all this false responsibility. Mm. It's actually not ours. It's not ours to carry. Yeah. Wow. I love that. I love the idea of being prepared. You are meant to do this. You were born into this role. We first yes. feel like we're born to be this individual, but like to be the, in the role of being a parent yes. and 
choosing that, saying, hey, this is my choice. I'm ready for this and I'm prepared for this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and having that confidence because a lot of times it's no one is prepared for parenthood. I don't care how many books you've read, how many Lamas classes you've taken. I don't care how many people around you have kids. Like when you're tossed into the world of, of parenting, you learn and you have to be able to partner with the Lord and the Holy Spirit to go, God, what? How do I do this? And yeah. <laughs> my prayer is like, Lord, help. <laughs> <laughs> I am open Lord, to receive help. all the help, Lord. <laughs> Lord, bring me caffeine. Ah, and- bring me that energy, <laughs> that toddler energy. That's going to be the caffeine shot, toddler energy. Yes. Uh, um, Nicole, I'm going to let you go so you can drive safe and get to your daughter's appointment. I appreciate your time. I loved yes. talking to you. And then if you want to hop on again, we can do it again another time. Um, yeah. If you want to plug in where people can find you before I let you go. Yeah, just Instagram is my full name. I'm Southern, Nicole Lynn Rowan, and YouTube is Rowan Through Life. It's our last name, Rowan Through Life. We do a lot of parenting family-ish things on there. So those are the two best places. I have a website, NicoleRowan.com, but social media is typically a good good arena these days. Yeah. All right. Well, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, you drive safe. Thank you. You're so sweet for having me on. Such an honor to be here and to share uh-huh. with your audience. I really love talking to you. I, I It's always odd to like go through and meet somebody and get into a really big personal conversation. So yeah. it's cool when like things align and you start flowing. You're like, whoa, I'm having realizations. Yes, I get it, girl. I get it. We'll have to connect beyond this. Yeah, I'd love to. All right, drive safe. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.